and welcome to today's press conference following this week's round of negotiations with the United Kingdom. I'm here with Michel Barnier, the European Commission's Chief Negotiator. And without further ado, I pass you the floor. Vous avez la parole, Mr. Barnier. Uh, many thanks, Dan. Uh, good uh, afternoon to all of you. Uh, merci beaucoup de votre... Thank you very much for being here uh, uh, and for uh, joining us. I hope you're all well, uh, despite the ongoing difficult circumstances. We're facing this serious coronavirus crisis, which has led to a great deal of unhappiness, misfortune. Uh, it's leading to unemployment difficulties. The virus is still here. So we all have to be vigilant and stay careful. But I'm delighted to be with you again virtually or otherwise. Uh, Mr. Barnier also thanks the interpreters for making this communication possible. You're welcome. He also says we help people understand each other. Well, we hope so. From the start of these negotiations, our objective was to make parallel progress on all the subjects of our future relationship. There are many such subjects because we are truly ambitious when it comes to this future relationship. And as I've said at the last round, for that to be possible, we needed to get rid of four serious areas of blockages on fishing and open and fair competition on so-called level playing field. These are two elements that are absolutely essential and cannot be separated out uh, from trade as we work towards a new economic partnership with the UK. Secondly, guarantees on fundamental rights. We need this to establish police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters that is close and tight. Third point, governance of the future partnership. This week, therefore, along with the UK delegation and David Frost, we agreed that we'd set a lot of time in our negotiating period for those four areas. And I'd like to thank David Frost and the two teams for the climate of mutual respect and the effort in the negotiations, both sides showed great respect for each other. They did very good work in these difficult circumstances, and I'd like to pay tribute to the professionalism of all concerned. However, at the end of this week, this latest week of negotiations, I still have my responsibility uh, under the aegis of our president, Ursula von der Leyen. I am the EU's negotiator, and my responsibility is to speak the truth and to tell the truth this week, there have been no significant areas of progress, starting with fishing. On fisheries, the UK have not shown any true will to explore other approaches beyond zonal attachment for the sharing of quotas. They continue to condition access to waters to an annual negotiation, which is not possible for us, not even technically possible. The EU wants to construct a stable economic partnership. That's always been our desire. Next point, level playing field. Economic uh, fair play, trade fair play. No progress there either, despite the fact that, as I said, on this week we tried to focus on certain topics in particular, on subjects in particular that we thought were closer to reaching agreement, such as things like the non-regression mechanisms when it came to social, environmental, climate-related uh, tax and fiscal matter and sustainable development. So no progress there either. And then on governance for the Futuna partnership, we're still a long way away from the framework we wanted, establishing legal links between our different areas of cooperation or a cross-cutting governance framework. Finally, on law enforcement, judicial cooperation and police cooperation, we were able to have a more constructive discussion on the issues of commitments arising from the European Convention of Human Rights, but there are still some important questions open as to how all that would be reflected 
in the agreement itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, on these points, as on other points, all we're asking for is for the political declaration to be respected and complied with. There has been no significant progress on these points, as I've said, not since the start of the negotiations. And I don't think we can go on like this forever. On top of that, the UK, as you know, have refused to extend the transition period, in other words, to allow for more time for negotiations. From our side, as indeed was already pointed out by President Tussler from line several months ago, we have always been open on our side, open to extending this period by one or two years. It's possible and written into the agreement. Our door is still open to that end. However, if there is no joint decision towards such an extension, as we understand it the case now, if there is no change, the UK will leave the single market and the customs union on the 30th of December. That's less than seven months away from now. Now, if we take into account what we have to have in terms of time to ratify an agreement, we have to have a legal text at the latest on the 31st of October. And that leaves us about five months, give or take. A wee bit less, in fact. We have to use this time as efficiently as possible, therefore. Indeed, last week I'd already proposed to David Ross that we should accompany the next rounds of negotiations on all subjects through, as of the start of June, which would be the next round, as end of June, the last round, at the end of June, more concentrated, focused uh, work on the more difficult points. I hope this will give a new boost to the 11 negotiation tables as such. And by the way, I also hope that we'll be able to start meeting face-to-face uh, -face again by the end of June, which is when the next uh, timeline is supposed to be. I think it'll work better. It'll be more effective and easier. We still have roughly five months, and I will continue to obviously work with my team and keeping full transparency with the 27 member states and uh, Parliament, European Parliament as well. Uh, to be clear, our lack of progress in this negotiation is not due to our method, but to the substance. We must stick to our commitments if we want to move forward. We engaged in this negotiation on the basis of a joint political declaration that clearly sets out the terms of our future partnership. This document, this document is available in all languages, including English. Uh, it is not difficult to read, uh, good uh, weekend reading if I may say. And this declaration was negotiated with Prime Minister Johnson himself. It was approved by the leaders of the 27 member states at the European Council in October 2019. It had the backing of the, the European Parliament also. It is for us, and it will remain for us, the only valid reference, the only relevant precedent in this negotiation, as it was agreed by both sides. Yet, round after round, our British counterparts seek to distance themselves from this common basis. Let me give you uh, four concrete examples, referring precisely to the text of the political declaration. First, the Prime Minister Johnson agreed in paragraph 77 that, I quote, given our geographical proximity and economic interdependence, our future agreement must encompass robust, robust commitments to prevent distortions of trade 
and unfair competitive advantages. This is what, together, we chose to call the level playing field. In this paragraph, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson agreed to uphold the common high standards applicable in the Union and the UK at the end of the transition period on these areas stated competition, social and employment standards, environment, climate change and relevant tax matters. We are today very far from this objective. Two, the Prime Minister Johnson agreed in paragraph 66 on civil nuclear cooperation to maintain our existing high standards of nuclear safety. We are very far from this objective. Three, Prime Minister Boris Johnson agreed in paragraph 82 that our agreement should cover anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. We are very far from this objective. Four, Prime Minister Johnson agreed in paragraph 118 to base our future relationship on an overarching institutional framework with links between specific areas of cooperation. And we are, once again, very far from this objective. In all areas, the UK continues to backtrack on the commitments it has undertaken in the political declaration, including on fisheries, where we committed to use our best endeavours to conclude and ratify a new agreement by the 1st of July 2020. It seems clear that we will not reach the target considering how the negotiations in this area are going for the moment. Even, ladies and gentlemen, in the rare areas where we saw some movement this week, such as the European Convention on Human Rights, we still fall short of what we had agreed in the political declaration. And finally, as a reminder, the UK, since the beginning, does not want to talk about our cooperation on foreign policy, development and defence at all, even though we agreed this with Boris Johnson in the political declaration. And to tell the truth on these points, defence and foreign policy, also as a former foreign affairs minister in my own country, I still don't understand why. We cannot and we will not accept this backtracking on the political declaration. And at the same time, we will request the full respect of the withdrawal agreement. On citizen rights, we continue to be extremely vigilant. There have been frequent exchanges of information between Vice President Maros Sefcovic and uh, the Minister Michael Gove on this topic regarding EU citizens residing in the UK. We are pleased to hear that uh, 3.1 million EU citizens have already been granted residence status. And we are carefully monitoring the situation of more vulnerable citizens that have difficulties applying digitally. It is also important that EU citizens residing in the UK have access to social benefits in these difficult times. As for UK nationals residing in the Union, in the 13 member states that, like the UK, have chosen a constitutive system, we are working to ensure that procedures for applying for residence status are simple, easily accessible, and clearly communicated. In the other 14 member states that have chosen a declaratory system, UK nationals will receive a physical document enabling them to prove 
their status. We also continue to be extremely vigilant with regard to the correct implementation of the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. The UK Common Paper published on the 20th of May is useful, but there are still a lot of details to be settled if we want to move from aspiration to operation in line with the legal treaty. Furthermore, some of the objectives set out in this common paper, such as avoiding exit declarations on goods moving from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, are incompatible with the legal commitments accepted by the UK in the protocol. So, we really need to work more on the technical details. Only a precise and rigorous implementation of the withdrawal agreement can create the confidence we need to build our future partnership. The 27 member states and the European Parliament have been very clear about this, including in our negotiating mandate. Voilà. Mesdames et Messieurs, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, in the coming days, I will have an opportunity. The Commission will be able to take stock with uh, President Charles Michel, with the 27 member states, with the President of the European Parliament and the European Parliament's uh, coordination group, led by David McAllister. Uh, during uh, the, the month of June, we will have a second meeting of the Joint Committee on the Withdrawal Agreement and its implementation, which will take place on the 12th of June. And then we will have a high-level meeting, which uh, we agreed to, no surprise, in the political declaration, which I mentioned several times. And this high-level meeting will take stock of the status of negotiations. We will also be we will need to set the precise date and the practical modalities, as we will have to do, too, for the dates and the modalities of the next round, probably as of the end of June or beginning of July. So, as you can see, in a short time frame, we are coming, moving towards the moment of truth. We expect the United Kingdom to respect its commitments under the... Uh, already ratified withdrawal agreement and to respect to the precise details of this uh, political declaration, which will remain the basis of our negotiations. If that is indeed the case, and if we can ensure and maintain the mutual respect we have shown to now, if we can remain serene in our approach, and we always have been serene and patient on the EU side, uh, adopting a calm but vigilant and determined approach, and we intend to remain like that. If we can maintain this approach, I believe that in the course of uh, the summer, at the very beginning of the autumn, we will be able to find some common ground between the EU and the UK, and that we will be able to find uh, an agreement for our future. On va passer maintenant aux questions.